Well, I'm here with Pat White. He is the CEO and co-founder of Bitwave. Pat, welcome. It's great to have you here. Brandon, thanks for having me. This should be uh, a fun discussion today. It's a crazy time in, uh, in the space that I'm in, so it uh, should be exciting to chat today. Well, you have some information on a very much needed topic when it comes to the accounting and financial side of crypto. I think everyone, no matter where their experience is at, they got questions about this stuff. And you also work pretty closely with some hedge funds and venture capital firms. So we're excited to pick your brain. But can you give us just a high level overview about yourself and what got you into this and what you're doing at Bitwave? Yeah, of course. So uh, my name is Pat. I'm the CEO of, of Bitwave. Uh, I am a enterprise software uh, guy for a very, very long time. So my first job out of college was with Microsoft. Uh, and I love enterprise software. I like I like this idea of solving really hard problems that you get to sink your, sink your teeth into. So I'm not uh, the guy who is going to go and start the next Twitter. Uh, but uh, I, I do really like these sort of like hard enterprise problems. I got into crypto about, and I'm, a, and I'm an engineer by training. I got into crypto about 2010. Uh, early on, I have some code contributed to Bitcoin Core node and things like that. I was a, uh, I liked crypto a lot from the very beginning. And I, I always sort of joke, I think back in my, in my younger days, I was maybe just a little, a, a, a touch more libertarian than I am today. And there was a lot of stuff about crypto that I liked. And I was, I was a lot poorer also. So, you know, I, I think there's this thing with people who love crypto, like the more bank fees they've paid at a point in their life, the more they like crypto or the more they hate the bank, the more they like crypto. So uh, I got into it back then, uh, enjoyed working on it. But, you know, like I said, I'm, a, I'm an enterprise software guy. So I, through and through, I was waiting for the intersection of, you know, enterprises and business and and crypto. So uh, I, uh, you know, after I was sort of working on, on uh, crypto, I, I went, we, I had a startup that did enterprise search, a couple other startups here and there, did a stint at Cisco. And then 2017, 2018, uh, set out with my co-founder to start Bitwave. And Bitwave is a, you know, we like to say it's a digital asset finance platform. What that means is it's a, you know, the way we tend to think about this is the day that a, a business and enterprise, a financial services organization, hedge fund, VC, whoever it is, the day they bring digital assets onto their balance sheet, they've just created a lot of problems for themselves. Uh, and that is to say, you know, you have obviously accounting and tax are really obvious ones, but treasury, FP&A, you know, suddenly we have customers who all of their revenue is in their token. So 100% of the revenue is in their token. Uh, all of their expenses are in a fiat currency, so USD or, or whatever it is. That's this like really classic uh, FP&A problem around forex hedging, uh, and that's you know that's it's one of the the many classic problems you run into. The difference between your revenue when your token is ten dollars versus when it's fifty cents uh, sure changes how you have to do your forecasting. So Bitwave is a it's a digital asset finance platform. Most of the, like any problem that you as a business kind of run into from accounting tax, uh, FP&A, treasury management, financial operations, ARAP, we have solutions up and down the stack for, uh, including a few other like more interesting things that are targeted on, you know, businesses or, or venture capital funds around invest, token investing and stuff like that. Uh, that's bit that's Bitwave in a nutshell. Yeah. So when these venture capital firms and hedge funds, they come in here, you know, how has the process of of doing their taxes like number one what does that look like and number two how has that changed over the years because you mentioned that you started in 2017 doing this and i have to remember you know as someone who's been around in, since 2017 it has changed vastly at least it feels that way to me doing your taxes yeah. back then six years ago versus today yeah i you know it, there's there's two parts of this that i'll say so on the on the vc side I think it's a little bit less on the hedge fund side but but similar because hedge funds will tend to have middle and back offices, whereas VCs almost never do. Like VCs generally work with fund admins who do all of their accounting. And that's that's all well and good until you throw some of the really crazy stuff that you could do in crypto at a at a VC. Like you throw at, at a at a uh, fund admin. You know, you even if you're working the fund admin that's that's touched crypto or knows what Bitcoin is, you throw a really complex DeFi transaction at them, DeFi decentralized finance, where you're you know staking staking tokens into a into a, a trading pool or into Ethereum or whatever it is. Um, you give them one of those transactions, they might have no idea what to do with it. So what we what we see very frequently is the fund admins actually push back a lot of their uh, crypto tax and accounting work to the funds themselves to do. 
which is kind of unheard of. Like you're not going to, most fund admins would not push back. If I, if I say, Hey guys, we just, you know, invest in a company. They're not going to be like, Hey, oh, oh, hey, we don't, we don't do that kind of thing here. Um, no, it's, 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 and so it's sort of interesting that there's, there's more pressure or there's more emphasis put on the actual funds to do the heavy lifting around accounting. Um, partly because there's not experience and partly because the, the tooling, you know, uh, that's where, that's where we come in and, and not all the fund admins are interested in learning new tools and stuff like that. They have their process. This is it's all very cookie cutter. They don't charge all that much money. So you really have to just, you have to fit into their mold or not. So that's like the, the trickiest part for a lot of these funds is that and we end up contracting, you know, we contract with some of the admins, but we actually end up contracting a lot with the funds, the VC, stuff like that, and working with their finance team to actually do their, their you know, accounting and taxes because they, they've been they've been ordered by their, their manager, their fund admin to actually do the work themselves. Now, I don't, I don't want to get you in trouble here, and this might not even be a question that you have an answer to, but when you're going through and you're looking at all the gains and losses that these that these people and these uh, companies are making, like, what is their main way? Like, are they doing lots of, like, spot trading, leverage trading? Is it contracts? Is it DeFi? You know, are they going through staking or lending protocols? Like, what do you see a lot of, and, like, how does that get more complex or easier for you? as you are yeah. having to have so many different areas of accounting accounted for. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, we can talk about it in general, of course, and we, we can't speak about specifics, but yeah. you know, in, in general, you certainly see a lot of uh, staking rewards. Like staking has become a major sort of strategy for a lot of folks to be earning yield within the space. Um, today, you know, this is, we're recording this, uh, what month is it? July, 2023. Uh, and and one of the new things that's coming out, who knows when it is, uh, is uh, these is stable coins with yields, so yield bearing stable coins, uh, which is again, it's it's really complicated to do the, uh, it's incredibly complicated to do the accounting for because essentially a yield bearing sta- uh, a yield bearing stable coin, the way it gets implemented, and this is this is sort of also answer your previous question about like what's different today than twenty seventeen, yeah. um, the way it gets implemented is is. You just wake up one day, like basically every few minutes, you just have more stable coin in your wallet. And this is like a real departure from like what you think about as a bank account or traditional yield. You put money into a CD, whatever, nine months later, you have more money. There's a distinct point, either a monthly or yearly basis that you are accruing that money. There's a very distinct point where you say, hey, I now have more money. Crypto mm. generally works in this in a much more kind of a curve-ish way where you're actually accruing every block that's happening. No, and blocks within Ethereum, for instance, happen every 13 seconds. So you're not you're not really going every 13 seconds to to see how much new money you made. You have to use some sort of aggregation rule. And you're looking at like what was my balance at midnight? What's my balance at midnight the next day? What you know, plus or minus deposits and withdrawals. That's the yield I earned. I need to snapshot it, connect that for that day. So you end up with a lot of really tricky problems uh, associated with these different types of activities and stuff like that. You know, I'd still say that the number one place where people have made the majority of their money in crypto usually is for people who invested early in in projects that that had that then went and did very well. Like the the, the reason VCs and hedge funds love crypto and family offices is instant access to liquidity with that you know instant access to liquidity on their on their investments. And oftentimes it's a 10 or 100x kind of uh, a movement there. So, you know, it's, it's one of the, the trends that I think, you know, I, I like to look at, 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 at things like crypto and I like to understand the trends that this sort of like underlies some of the technology and, and why it's getting popular and stuff. And this is a really good example is that, you know, the nature of, of whether it be VC or hedge fund, uh, it's gotten more competitive. There's higher pressure. And there's always been this tension, especially within VC, about how quickly you get access to your funds. And so crypto was this really first time, uh, if we think about VC as like a, you know, 100, 100 plus year old enterprise, crypto was the first time you really did have these moments of really quick access to liquidity. And I think that's going to be a trend that we're going to see pushed over and over again, which is that more and more VCs, more and more hedge funds are really going to want to have, uh, you know, how do I get three to six month access to liquidity. I might not sell it. I might not, I might not sell it, but if I have to, it'd be great to be able to do it. And I think that's going to push into, you know, legislation around secondary markets for startups and all this kind of stuff. So super interesting time in the market. And, and that's also what's so great about crypto is you can imagine 
other, you know, you can imagine tokenization of startup stock onto the blockchain and then really quick liquidity access there. I mean, that's that's kind of the dream is that pretty much any any asset that you have out there could be tokenized and thrown on the blockchain and then something you are you are raring to go. So it's a it's a fun time. It's a fun time in the overall industry. And there's interesting, interesting tensions happening. Yeah. And so I, I want to switch this over to more of the everyday average person side of things. Like what can these people do? A lot of the people that are probably watching this, what can they do to help with their crypto tax saving strategies? You know, I'm sure there's tax loss harvesting. There's a lot of stuff out there, but what are some unique ways that they can look to? Well, first and foremost, what, the, the first thing I always say about, about crypto taxes uh, is you know, uh, uh, Americans, I'd say, take a special deep pride in doing their taxes on April 14th. You know, there's this part of it's just like <laughs> the longer you the longer you don't do your taxes and, and save it to the last minute. Yeah, I, I, I mean, and I'm as guilty as anyone. I've been in, in lines at the at the post office on on April 15th to, to send my taxes away. Crypto is just not it's not friendly for that. Like, don't don't wait on it. Get your taxes started early. Get your taxes figured out really early. Work if you're a business. Work with with Bitwave because we have a full solution for businesses, enterprises, and hedge funds, VCs, all of that. Work with a lot of big ones. Uh, if you're an individual, find a good software solution that you and your CPA can can use and that you're happy with. Uh, potentially find one that can integrate with the TurboTax and use TurboTax things like that. There's there is stuff that's out there that's really interesting. So tax loss harvesting. Every product has some flavor of tax loss harvesting calculations in it. Um, it's it's a really interesting whether or not it's actually legal. And I always like to talk about this, which is that, you know, it's a lot of people don't think, you know, we've seen clients that basically have taken the position that they sell and then immediately rebuy the asset and they are able to recognize that loss. And I think in traditional securities markets, that would be a wash trade. That's very clearly a wash trade. A lot of people don't think the wash trading applies to crypto uh, because the wash trading law well, crypto didn't exist, and, and it's like very clear that it's that's related to stocks, stocks and bonds. Uh, but there's sort of this you get to this like letter of the law versus spirit of the law kind of debate on it. And there's there's a very real world where uh, the IRS could decide that washing laws apply to crypto, and they can do that retroactively. And boy, oh boy, is a lot easier to uh, just not have that problem in your world. So we say, you know, it's one of the things if you are looking to do tax loss harvesting, which is, I mean, everyone everyone loves it. It's a great, especially in a year like this when things are down. Uh, you know, one option, this is not financial advice, but it's a way that you can, something you can run by your your CPA and ask their thoughts on it. There are other assets that end up being very equivalent. So in the same way that tax loss harvesting on, on a robo-advisor goes from Vanguard funds to Admiral funds, well, those are the same thing, but, you know, uh, uh, Fidelity funds to Vanguard funds, the, uh, you know, you can do something like go from Bitcoin to wrapped Bitcoin. And wrapped Bitcoin is, a, is an ERC-20 token on the Ethereum blockchain. Bitcoin's obviously on the Bitcoin blockchain. Depending on your advisor, they might take the opinion that those are totally separate assets. So a trade between them is is technically a non-wash tradable. And, and honestly, you don't even have to do the trade back. You just move into that asset. And now you have now you've actually done a, a harvest there. There are other ways too. You, know, you can go into a liquidity pool that has a portion of Bitcoin and something else, and something you've gained access to exposure to Bitcoin. You've made a demonstrable uh, change of the underlying asset. Uh, and and you're not and then you don't ever trade back. So you're not going into a different into that wash trade situation. A month later, you trade back just to be safe if you want to do it that way. So that's what I always say is is you know talk to before you before you think that you can just wash trade your problems away. Talk to an advisor uh, and and look at other ways of kind of doing different asset classes, like movements between physical assets that actually would allow that are more defensible from a wash trading perspective or from a tax loss harvesting perspective. Absolutely. Well, Pat, that was all very, very valuable. We appreciate your insight and all this. Where can people continue to follow you and Bitwave on your journey? Yeah, www.bitwave.io is where you can find us or just Google for us uh, or Bitwave underscore platform on Twitter. Uh, I'm at Pat White on, on Twitter. I found myself using Twitter less and less, though. It's a, Twitter's a strange place right now. Uh, it's a strange world out there. But uh, please find us if this is something that you need. Uh, Bitwave.io is a great place. We have tons of resources. Uh, there's a link to something called Bitwave University that goes through everything I've talked about here and and more in, in incredible, excruciating detail. Uh, is is uh, tons of knowledgeable knowledge based article videos, things like that. And you can even, if you happen to be a CPA watching, you can even get CPE credits from the the Bitwave view. So really uh, fun fun stuff over over here. Well, Pat, again, appreciate you joining us. Thanks so much. 
Thank you so much for having me. Really fun, uh, fun chat.